Welcome to Zion Fellowship's Bible Wire. In these podcasts, we discuss what the Bible says, line upon line and precept upon precept. Today, Ben Allen will be continuing our study on the book of Acts. Settle in for the next few minutes and learn more about who God is and how he loves. Hi, everyone. Last episode, we discussed Luke's continued use of the Psalms and laying out the identification of Jesus' disciples suffering with Christ's suffering. And we came closer to understanding the church's role in this eschatological age. Luke uh, begins this next section in today, uh, again, highlighting the generosity of the earliest Christians in uh, to another in uh, Acts 2. 44 through 45. Let's start with the text. We're in Acts 4, 32 through 37. Again, Acts 4, 32 through 37. I'm reading out of the ESV. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it to the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called Uh, by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, uh, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. In verse, uh, that's the end of the reading. So in verse 32, we see this now sizable megachurch expand rapidly when Luke writes that they were of one in heart and mind, Cardia, which means heart in Greek, chi and psyche, life, mia, meaning one. He implies both friendship and unity of purpose. He goes on to explain the practical outworking of this in their corporate experiences. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. They held all the things in common. Such language was employed in Hellenistic treaties on friendship. Witherington, uh, a scholar, uh, Ben Witherington III, observes that friendship in the Greco-Roman mold often involved reciprocity between those who were social equals. But Luke portrays a community where funds are provided for those who are needy without any thought of return, and thus he is suggesting something more akin to family duties. It should be also remembered that in the Old Testament, looks forward to the time when God will give his people singleness of heart and action. This is Jeremiah 32, verse 39, and a new heart and a new spirit, Ezekiel 36, 26. Um, What the day of Pentecost started enabled a new love for God and others. Sharing was not a matter of compulsion, and only some property was sold. Possessions and money were disposed of at will as individuals saw fit. And as an aside, I should point out, this is not as some would like to portray as a communist commune. Rather, it was a voluntary giving motivated by a changed heart. In verse 33, the apostles are declaring the gospel and preaching, and the church is displaying the gospel in generosity. As apostles continued to teach the church about the resurrection, individuals within the church learned that the resurrection power of Jesus resided in them. They gained a proper perspective on possessions as they pondered the resurrection. And in the exalting Jesus commentary, we see the next two verses described in this way. It says, quote, Wealthy people existed in the early church. The Bible does not say they were there were no rich people among the first Christians. Rather, we read that there were there was not a needy person among them. Luke isn't describing communis, commu, communism here. He is talking about a group of generous people who are sensitive to the needs of others, 
No one went to bed hungry because they could prevent it. No one slept on the street. No one went without clothes. The members took care of one another, and the wealthy even sold property in order to ensure this reality. If you are wealthy, you need to see it as both a blessing and a responsibility. God has gifted you, but you are accountable for what you do with the resources entrusted to you. Scripture doesn't teach that you should necessarily sell it all. Unless, of course, Jesus tells you to. But you must take passages like 1 Timothy 6, 17-19 to heart. It says, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant, or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of what is truly life. The wealthy people mentioned in Acts 4 provide a wonderful example of what it looks like to embrace and apply this text. End quote. In the last two verses, we are introduced to a new character within the narrative, a man named Barnabas. He, or excuse me, we see him later invest into younger believers in chapter 9. We see... He has a good eye and a glad heart in chapter 11 and encouraged believers to remain faithful to the Lord. He was a humble, trustworthy, and patient man with flaws, with the flaws of others. And here, his generosity is highlighted. His act of laying his goods before the apostles' feet show his submission, humility, and trust. One of the future leaders of the Gentile mission expresses his submission to the twelve by receiving from them a new name and laying his goods at their feet. Luke is presenting an early expression of the unity between the leaders of the Jewish and Gentile missions. Genuine Christian community is presented in this chapter as involving both mission and mutual support or fellowship. These occur because people care about one another and the care they share. Such community is experienced when the grace of God is powerfully at work through the preaching of the gospel and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Barnabas is progressively revealed as a model disciple because he unites himself in such a way that the concern for mission and the welfare of others is taking paramount of importance. It doesn't seem to be for his self propaganda. It doesn't seem that he's uh, promoting himself, but rather for the glory of God. Luke introduces him here uh, because he stands in stark contrast in the next section, the next episode, with Ananias and Sapphira. In doing this, Luke is saying, be like Barnabas, not like Ananias and his wife. Although an, an, uh, only a field was sold, ownership of the land was the principal source of wealth and social standing in the Greco-Roman world. Churches couldn't make it without generous heroes like Barnabas. The church has been sustained, enriched, and blessed by unsung heroes throughout her century. And, and her history, excuse me. And by those who have given generously to kingdom causes. We need to honor such servants, and we need to encourage people to see the extraordinary impact of a faithful, personal, giving ministry. Just as some Christians have a lifetime of teaching ministry ahead of them, others have positioned or are positioned to spend their lifetimes blessing others through financial giving. May we be a people who look for ways to give generously, sacrificially, and gladly. May the truth of the resurrection and a deep grasp of God's grace make us Barnabas-like servants. May such generosity lead to a wonderful experience of unity. We have reached the end of today's Bible Wire podcast. If you'd like more information about our church, or if you'd like more resources related to this podcast, you can find us online at www.zionfellowship.net. We're also available on social media. Look for Zion Fellowship. Thank you for joining us today on Bible Wire.